Okay, we are going to get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for taking time out of your day for joining us for today's CNCF webinar, Security in the World of Service Meshes. I'm Jerry Fallon, and I will be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenter today, John A. Joyce, Principal Engineer at Cisco Systems. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, so please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. So please do not add anything to the chat or questions that are in violation of the Code of Conduct. Please be respectful of your fellow participants and presenters. And please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinar. And with that, I will hand it over to John for today's presentation. Hi, everybody. Um, hope everybody's having a good day. Um, as Jerry said, my name is John Joyce. I've been at Cisco for quite a while, many, many years. Um, and about the last five or six or so, I've been working predominantly in uh, cloud-related uh, businesses. Um, a few years on OpenStack, uh, a few years on Istio. In the last couple of years, I've been spending uh, a bit of time on Network Service Mesh and some other related projects uh, that uh, we might cover a little bit today. So let's, with that, let me get started. Okay, here's the agenda. So uh, the part, a little bit of the agenda is going to be more educational, um, talking about uh, how mesh security lines up, what kind of things are happening in the mesh security world, what kind of features and functions are being used. Uh, but then we'll move on to some cur current implementations, a little bit on some of the stuff that uh, is happening um, and some of the things we are doing also within those communities to uh, promote uh, different uh, choices and architectures. So the purpose is just the abstract. Uh, you've all seen this, so I'm not really going to spend any time on it. Um, it'll be in the slides if you want to look at it, but it's uh, pretty straightforward. It's what got you here. So let's talk a little bit about um, uh, what what security in the service mesh means, or what, what are the key things? So let's start with some definitions. So the first and most important thing is we need identity. So we need some way of deciding uh, a thing, person, process, module, whatever you want to call it, is who they are, and, and a way to track and, and certify that that, uh, that that thing, that element, is what it is. So that's that's the first and most important thing that uh, uh, that kind of triggers all the rest of this talk. So uh, once we have um, uh, identity, then we want to do something uh, that's often called auth in in this environment or authentication. Um, it's the verification of the identity. We want to make sure uh, that uh, who we're talking to is who they uh, say they are. And uh, when we start talking about service meshes, there's a couple different forms of that authentication. There might, there's probably even more than I list here, but these are the two ones that I'm going to really cover a little bit in this talk. One is um, what we might call transport or peer authentication, and it's uh, sort of the, uh, uh, the immediate uh, authenticating your immediate peer, okay? Even though the actual flow or request may be uh, going through uh, intermediaries. And of course, in a service mesh, you're typically going through proxies, so you usually have lots of intermediaries between the, uh, the ultimate uh, beginning and the ultimate end of a, of a flow or request. Um, there's also something called origin or request auth. There's a couple of different names for this uh, you might see out there uh, besides even the ones I list here. Um, and this is actually trying to make sure that both the sender, the, the, the initial sender and the final receiver um, have some ability to authenticate each other or at least uh, authenticate one side of it. Then we talk a little bit about authorization, which is uh, sort of now that we know an identity or assuming we know an identity, um, you might want to grant different privileges or access levels to uh, that identity. Uh, so it's a little bit uh, the next level of uh, choice and, and it uh, gives you a lot more granularity and control over how you might want to do things. Um, so how do we want to express that identity? Well, there's two things, definitions here, certificates, um, which include a, uh, a key and an identity. And typically in this space, we're dealing with X509. Um, and in SVID, we'll talk about this a little bit more. It's a spiffy um, 
um, uh, document, identity document. Um, um, transport layer security is the key uh, sort of protocol we'll be using um, when we're talking, especially when we're talking about peer or transport authentication. So we'll talk about uh, TLS quite a bit. Um, and zero trust, you hear that they're all over the place these days. Um, I chose to put this definition here because I thought it was best. Uh, there might be others. Um, and it's used in marketing all over the place these days, but um, it, it's really trying to say, hey, you don't assume any peer is trusted, regardless of who, where, what kind of domain, scope, um, network, uh, whatever, you know, whether it's in front of a, a firewall, uh, behind a firewall, whether it's in a VPN. The idea is that you don't trust anybody um, and you want to make sure you go through authentication and, and even authorization steps with everybody you talk to. So um, when we talk about service meshes, there's a couple of TLS flavors that uh, um, uh, we should talk about. Um, so I've kind of listed them here. Um, mutual TLS is sort of the gold standard. That's what um, uh, most meshes, uh, service meshes seem to be trying to get to, um, but not, not all of them are there yet. Um, then there's also a server-side TLS, uh, which is uh, where the, the, basically the, the server presents a certificate that the client can uh, Authenticate, but not the other way around. Um, and then sometimes there's, uh, um, and some of the meshes support um, uh, uh, even client TLS, where the client uh, presents a certificate and the server doesn't um, uh, present its identity. Uh, so you only do TLS. Um, uh, you, you, the, the encryption is obviously good, but not both. But both sides aren't authenticated um, from an identity perspective. So a couple of references here, just the, um, the only real thing I want to say on this slide other than to ha you to have it is that I'm going to talk a little bit about network service mesh. And for those people that are very familiar with what I like to call application service mesh, like Istio and Linkerd, network service mesh is different. It's not dealing um, much with layer seven at all. It's uh, dealing more with layer three or four. Um, we like to Kid uh, Ed Warnerke, who who's one of the big promoters from Cisco of that technology, that he just hijacked the name, and he'll agree. So he kind of took advantage of the service mesh um, sort of uh, PR and uh, kind of used the name to. Um, but but it does represent some of the same mesh concepts of trying to interconnect things. It just does so more at like a layer three and four constructs than at layer seven constructs. But I'll talk about that uh, a little bit here later. So, um, well, how do we want to establish an identity? So when we're talking about service meshes, we'll talk about workloads, um, we'll talk about pods, you know, those kind of things. Um, but we need to establish an identity. And I borrowed uh, this uh, bullet list um, from uh, one of the Istio decks. Uh, I'm not sure it's still there. It might be a little uh, antiquated at current times, but th these are the types of um, identities that are used within service meshes uh, to um, kind of uh, key to a workload so that we can recognize them. I'm not going to list them all here. I think many of these should be familiar with people. Uh, the one thing I do want to point out, and we'll talk about this quite a bit later on, is um, Spiffy and uh, Spiffy is a, a CNCF project, um, and it's a specification of how to represent identity and, and a little bit of how to do some auth n. Um, Spire is an implementation of that, um, uh, which is also a CNCF project. Spire is one implementation of the Spiffy specification. Um, I'll talk about these a little bit below, <clears throat> but these are really um, starting to be some of the key uh, cloud native uh, capabilities to establish an identity and to be able to validate it, that identity. Um, although it all sometimes relies on uh, some of the above constructs like Kubernetes service account, as we'll see later. <clears throat> so, well, um, one of the key things we need to do once we have that identity is, uh, well, we need to get it into uh, a certificate or we need a way to uh, present that identity to a peer so they can authenticate it. So um, this, uh, uh, flow here is a, is a common flow that service meshes use, a common way that they handle uh, uh, generating um, a, a certificate with an identity um, so that it can be authenticated by a peer. Um, so the, the uh, private key um, is generated by the workload, um, but then uh, the uh, a signing request is sent to the control plane 
so that they can find that um, 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 uh, key and, and therefore it's uh, authenticatable by a peer. Um, and the, the control plane can self-sign it. There's a number of choices here. The two I mentioned here is the you know, self-signed root certificate or uh, maybe uh, the signing is, uh, comes from an external source like Vault. Um, then the control plane provides the proxy um, that certificate uh, uh, scope to the identity of the pod. So in other words, the proxy uh, can only use that certificate uh, when uh, connected within the pod of the associated service account. Um, control plane manages the rotation. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, quite a few meshes uh, support optionally, or even um, perhaps it's the only option to uh, do this less automatically and just uh, mount them uh, via files or, or whatever into the pods and proxies directly. So let's talk a little bit about um, the authentication layers. So um, th this is uh, an example of the two sort of uh, layers that uh, I talked about before where you know, we have a, a proxy, um, uh, workload A communicating to workload C. Um, it has to go through a bunch of intermediaries. Maybe maybe this uh, middle piece here is just uh, ingresses and egresses, perhaps. Uh, but it's going to go through some intermediaries uh, to get from uh, the ultimate uh, sender, or from the, the, the original sender to the ultimate uh, uh, server or receiver. So, um, what we want to do is we want to make sure that at each hop along the way, um, we can do some transport uh, auth -end. Um and, and if we can do that via MTLS, that's best. It uh, provides for encryption of the communication, um, uh, whether it's TLS or MTLS. But if it's MTLS, then not only does it provide the encryption, but it also ensures that, that each side is sure who they're talking to. Um, and then, Independent of these hops, um, there may be a need for uh, the proxies or a desire for the proxies to do some uh, what what I label here origin auth, where the the proxy will actually be able to ensure that um, it's not at the the initial sender and the initial receiver do some uh, communication to make sure um, they are who they expect they are. Um, now. In this case, I show the original auth uh, being done between the proxies, but of course, um, that, that can also be done um, uh, by, directly by the workloads in some fashion outside of the scope of the service mesh itself. So, continuing on. So here, here gives a sequence. Uh, I borrowed this sequence from um, uh, a site here um, uh, that I list. Um, it it uh, is just, uh, I mean, there's nothing special about this from the perspective of service meshes, but I wanted to make sure people who are not familiar with MTLS understand sort of the sequence, but you'll basically have a, a client with some, some client certificate of uh, both who they are and, and, and keys and, and whatnot associated with its identity. The server will have something similar. Um, the client will uh, request to protect the resources, then there'll be a handshake back and forth so that they can present each other's certificates. Um, during that handshake, each side will use some kind of um, method um, shown here, it's a certificate authority, some kind of method to ensure that the, the, um, the peer that it's talking to is who they expect they are. Um, if those Certificates are all to a common root, then then it's all within the um, uh, certificate itself is verifiable. But there's other techniques too that are emerging to go beyond just the common root certification. Um, but each side does that, and then uh, at the end, uh, the the server uh, um, or the client is able to access the protected resource. So let's talk a little bit about. Um, single-sided TLS versus M MTLS. So, um, so uh, you, mutual. I said mutual TLS is a gold standard, but it's not the only option um, that can be supported. There's a couple of reasons for this. I, I list them here. Um, uh, I won't necessarily go through all the bullets here, so you can read read ahead a little bit. But I mean, the main idea is that um, you you don't you can't assume always that you have full authentication. 
um, with both sides of a connection. There are lots of reasons why you may need to communicate with someone that you can't identify. Um, but, but at least knowing that, then you have the capability to take different protections or controls or whatever to help protect um, both yourself and any other peers behind you uh, within the same security networking domain, whatever you want to say. Um, and and, and when, when, when you can't do MTLS um, or, or, you know, some of the meshes may not support it, then uh, single-sided TLS is useful because of, it'll provide you the encryption. Um, as, I, as I talked about before, there's both the server side, which is very, very common um, in most of the uh, service meshes out there. Um, client side uh, support is uh, available in some cases, but many meshes don't support like a client side certification. Um, and of course, uh, many of the meshes uh, uh, also support clear tux, um, but the expectation is the clear tux is more for debugging um, or uh, you know uh, trialing or other reasons, um, and wouldn't be a production. You'd never use it in a production scenario. <clears throat> Um, so uh, once a peer has authenticated, well, the next step is to decide it's auth authorized. Uh, so uh, authorization will determine the, you know, whether the sender and receiver have the necessary privileges or permissions to talk to one another. Um, it could be the sender um, may be allowed send, but the, the receiver may not want to accept from that sender or or um, I mean, it could be it's it's a since it's a policy uh, decision. It can be done a number of different ways, and is very uh, can be very uh, ex expressive and expansive as to how you want to uh, perform that authorization. But but of course, uh, it, it, for that to make sense, you must have first made sure that you had the identity uh, understood and and established. Um, otherwise, authorization makes very little sense. Um, <clears throat> Now, the one thing I wanted to point out with authorization is um, it, it's, it's fairly common in many service meshes. It's offered in some of the APIs, uh, uh, some of the uh, APIs like um, SMI and stuff like that, but not necessarily is it um, available um, for all the um, of all the meshes. Uh, excuse me one second. Apologize. Sorry about that. Um, and the authorization may be implemented um, either by the client side proxy or the server side proxy um, or both. So uh, the the final point that I wanted to make here is when we talk about authorization uh, here in a lot of this talk, I'm really talking about authorization from the perspective of the service mesh. Obviously, um, both with authentication and authorization, the uh, the client and the service, the client and the server above the proxies may be doing all sorts of, uh, of uh, capabilities and functions of their own in both of these areas. So I'm not covering those kind of details at all. So. Um, Let's see, now I'm gonna kind of move away from sort of the, the um, a little bit less of the educational aspects and a little bit more into um, who's, who's really doing these things and how are they doing it. So uh, here I, I uh, chose to highlight how Linkerd does its authentication architecture. Um, so, and it, very, it follows fairly similar to that process that I described before. So the service account, um, it, uh, from Kubernetes provides the sort of uh, uh, provides the workload and an identity, um, and uh, Linkerd the Linkerd controller um, will sign a certificate um, uh, with that uh, based on that identity, and have it uh, in a way that we can use PKI techniques to validate. A peer can use PKI techniques to validate it, and. It does that uh, via um, some of the certificate signing requests and, 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 and trust anchors that it's passing over to the proxies. And, and once that's all done, uh, then the MTLS handshake can happen at the proxy level and the application is unburdened by the need to perform this uh, um, handshake nor uh, 
deal with any of the service accounts, signing requests, trust anchors, any of that. So it uh, it sort of frees the application to be a lot more streamlined. So um, authorization architecture is sort of much the same. There's typically some kind of policy module in the service mesh controller. Um, the policy module will push um, uh, the config over to the sidecar proxies. Um, and when it's expressing that config, um, if it's for these uh, links in the middle, um, it can express the config uh, both in terms of the identity within the mesh that it's well aware of and has established. So it's able to express this uh, in a very clean, um, uh, non-ambiguous way. Whereas um, if it's doing um, authorization on, uh, on either the ingress side or the egress side of a, of a flow, uh, it's, uh, it, it won't have the same uh, unambigu unambiguous set of information. So it has to be expressed uh, a little bit differently because the source identity would be from outside the mesh um, while the destination identity um, is within the mesh. So um, there's lots of different uh, sort of capabilities and granularity that come in with respect expressing the authorization. So uh, what I did to try to um, it, it show this is um, um, an example from uh, the SMI, uh, uh, the SMI um, API, if you will. Um, and what, what uh, this particular example, very, very simple example, um, shows that you're spe specifying um, a destination identity via service count. Um, you're expressing some ports that are, will be used that, that will be used in, in the destination and namespaces. Then you're um, uh, pre pre preventing uh, specifying a match criteria, and in this case, you're just referring to another API object. Um, but um, uh, and that API object, um, the, uh, in this case, um, um, HTTP route group can talk about the different HTTP paths or, or uh, routes within the layer seven that are being that should be authorized or prevented. So, for example, you could prevent uh, a certain based on a certain URL path, uh, prevent uh, uh, certain sources from going there while other sources can get there, that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, uh, on the uh, you also have the option of specifying the uh, source identity. Um, in this case, um, in this example case that I grabbed, it's uh, letting sources from the um, uh, uh, Prometheus service account um, access um, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the destination. So, um, so now let's talk a little bit about uh, Spiffy and Spire. So uh, as I said before, uh, I kind of covered the first two bullets um, a little bit. And it's um, the, the the Spiffy uh, provides a, a framework to be able to um, bootstrap and, and issue identity services across heterogeneous environments. So it's really uh, because of that, it's really suitable uh, for today's cloud native applications. So it's really and, and the way I'll show in a demo later, the way we kind of use it is because. Uh, we have a very multi. We have multi-cluster environments, and in fact, those uh, clusters may not be all from the same uh, uh, security domain. They may be from different providers. So we want to be able to make sure we have a framework that can allow um, the security identity to still be specified clean and <clears throat> in a clean way and secure way. Um, so service meshes um, are, are moving uh, very quickly towards Spiffy. There's a lot of, um, uh, you see a lot of sort of uh, issues and PRs and whatnot uh, moving that way, um, but they're not all uh, supporting it in exactly the same way, um, nor are they all necessarily port supporting all the uh, aspects of Spiffy. So there's different um, levels of support or different ports or portions of the Spiffy spec that different meshes will support. Um, and uh, uh, the, the network service mesh, as I mentioned, network service mesh, uh, I'll show in, in a lot of detail uh, in a little bit how network service mesh is using Spiffy Inspire. Um, but the other um, 
other service meshes that uh, uh, support parts of the specific specification call, include Kuma, Console Connect, Istio. Uh, there may be more. I wasn't trying to be uh, fully research the uh, level of support here across the universe of service meshes. So when we talk about SPIFI, the key thing is an SVID. I'll, I'll refer to that a number of times before, and it's, it's based on an X509 certificate, <clears throat> which includes the um, a SPIFI identifier, which I've highlighted here. Um, I hope, I'm not, uh, hope I wasn't hiding part of my screen by the Zoom call. If I did, I apologize. Difficult to get feedback from people who aren't allowed to talk, but apologize about that if I was. Um, so here's the uh, the the SVID format uh, that SPIFI specifies. Uh, now we'll talk a little about about the architecture. Um, it has a server architecture, uh, an agent um, it has a workload API. So the workload, by the way, this is borrowed from the uh, SPIFI um, um, uh, website. So these are all figures coming from the SPIFI website. Um, so it has a registration API because there's a need to sort of register uh, identity. I mean, not the identity, but register who's who you're going to um, uh, be able to, you know, which agents you're going to talk to and how you're going to identify those agents. So there's a bit of a bootstrapping that's needed via registration API. But once that's done, then the server uses the node API to talk to the um, agents. Uh, the agents uses the workload API to talk to the workloads. So um, by this means, we have a way to both uh, ensure that the workloads who are who they are and that they're running on nodes uh, that, that we we know of. Um, and it gives a full chain of trust um, uh, uh, along the, um, uh, and a full chain of identity um, uh, along in, in these sort of cloud native environments. So. Um, here's some details on the Spire uh, design um, details. Uh, I mentioned the registration API. I mentioned the agents. Um, and there's a bunch of different plugins that they have for um, um, that the server can use. Uh, it can inter interface with an upstream CA um, if it wishes. It, uh, the key manager controls uh, how it's going to uh, store the keys and what kind of formats it's going to use on the disk. Um, it has some uh, data store plugins for which uh, data stores or databases it's going to store its data in. Um, and then it has some node, a test or node resolver uh, plugins to deal with node attest attestation um, and uh, also within different environments. So a tiny bit on the uh, Spire uh, uh, node agent design here. So we talked about the workloads. The workloads we'll call the API. I'll, I'll show that a little bit later. Um, it has uh, a, a, a node tester, a workload tester, a key manager as well, similar uh, types of uh, operations as I described on the server. Uh, there's different paths for K8 versus Unix um, if it's trying to uh, do a workload attestation on the uh, Unix versus uh, K8 environment. Uh, here's an example of the flow. The workload will will uh, call the API to um, uh, request uh, its identity be provided. Um, the 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 agent will do some attestation to ensure the workload um, is who they are. And there's a, uh, I don't want to get into all the details of uh, the different attestation that it can support. But uh, to keep it simple, in the in the case perspective, it's typically the service account that we'll use. So there's a there's some communication with K8s and Kubelet to get that service account or and make sure it's who who they um, make sure the service account that's applied is um, as expected. And I'll get into that a little bit uh, in the demo here, and then back uh, provide the uh, an, an SVID uh, to the workload. So. Um, that's a little bit on Spiffy and Spire. Excuse me. Now I'm going to talk about uh, some of the different identity models that uh, we have within service meshes. And uh, this is where I'll introduce some, some new things that uh, we are working on uh, within uh, some of the communities um, and also talk a little bit more 
and show what we're doing specifically with network service mesh. So uh, probably most of the audience is familiar with this. Uh, nearly all the sort of service mesh multi-cluster uh, models have examples of uh, the shared root trust. Uh, it's a, a simple model, basically assume every cluster is able to get its um, uh, certificates from a common common root and all the generations happens through a common root. Uh, uh, there might be intermediates along the way, but it, it's at least traceable back to the common root. Pretty simple model, but it sort of assumes that you have that sort of common trust domain that works for all clusters, all locations and whatnot. And that, uh, um, that, that that's, uh, works in a lot of cases, even in geographical uh, distributed cases that can work, but uh, it's not uh, won't work in all scenarios. So um, one thing that uh, uh, we've been working on uh, with uh, Istio and the service mesh community is something that we uh, show here as uh, bridge trust. It's something that uh, um, is just uh, coming out uh, in, in flight now um, in, in real time. And what it involves is where we actually try to allow um, uh, sort of go forward a little bit. We basically allow uh, this cluster to be entirely its own trust domain and MTLS within this uh, um, cluster will be based on the native service mesh that's over here. Similarly, um, um, the native service mesh over here will have a different uh, root, different trust domain and be able to do its own thing, but we still want MTLS in the middle. So that's why we'll introduce um, uh, the ability to provide this, what I label here as a trust domain um, uh, between the ingress and the egress. So uh, the way we do that is that, uh, I mean, I uh, the, the way the service mesh does it, it isn't changed. That the, each of these service meshes in, this, in, in the case that we're, we, we've been trying out at this deal and this deal, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, but the, the, they, these service meshes control their own um, uh, certificate and identity management, however they want to do it, um, however the, uh, the client and the gateways talk or the server and the gateways talk, um, uh, we don't really get involved with. But then what we do here, um, um, in this case, I list SMH or service mesh hub is, is kind of how we're doing it. Um, we basically have our own uh, set of intermediate certificates that we're uh, providing to both the ingress gateway and the egress gateway to be able to provide that bridge trust um, as I'm labeling it here. Um, I won't necessarily kind of go through these one by one, but the idea here is MTLS between these guys based on this meshes um, uh, identity frameworks and then certificate frameworks, um, then MTLS uh, between these guys uh, based on uh, this uh, intermediary and then MTLS uh, over here. So you have MTLS all the way through, but you don't have, uh, you're not uh, forcing the client and the server to be uh, to the same common um, <clears throat> root certificate. So uh, there's some, some scenarios where this can be useful. So uh, moving on, and, and, and I know there's been a number of uh, talks and presentations and some work um, in various, uh, uh, in a number of different cases for, for this model here, where we call, we, we talk about federated identity. Um, and uh, we, we've, we've been spending some time on this, although uh, we don't necessarily have it all fully working yet. Uh, but the idea here is that you uh, have federated identity between, um, well, I show it as Istio D here, but um, Istio D uh, or, or the, the service mesh over here, um, it doesn't necessarily have to deal, um, with, it can sort of deal a little bit as its own uh, trust domain and likewise over here. But when this guy and this guy or gal wanna communicate to each other, they have to have a trust bundle that can uh, include both A and B. So um, if, if this one's uh, communicating over this way, um, it, it, this one will have to have both a little bit of A and B so that it can identify this guy and then likewise um, uh, identify this guy on that side. So um, the um, um, Istio has some capabilities right now to specify uh, these uh, trust bundles with uh, um, 
you know, pointing to basically pointing uh, to a, a different Spire server uh, based on a domain. So based on a domain, you point to a Spire server that could be multiples of these, and that allows Istio to uh, provide a, a more complete trust bundle um, <clears throat> for um, with with both the A and the B uh, components. So. Um, now, now shifting a little bit back to NSM or network service mesh, uh, which as I mentioned before uh, is more layer three and four oriented than, than the application service meshes, but um, it's been in the forefront of adopting um, some of the Spiffy Spire implementations. Um, and it uses the, the Spire servers to provide the identity for the different network service mesh elements uh, as they're communicating to each other uh, uh, the, um, so, so it's the identity framework they use. Uh, they use, they don't, uh, there's an option if you're playing with network service mesh is a secure and an insecure option. So you can sort of do it without this level of uh, security, but it's, um, it's available and, and it's the security framework they use. Um, so you may not be familiar with, uh, NSM, but the, um, uh, some of the key modules I'll talk about um, are uh, network service clients, network service endpoints, network service registers, and network service managers. Um, in a way, for the perspective of this talk, you don't necessarily need to understand too well um, exactly what these do unless you are really interested or you know NSM. But the key point that we're trying to show is how um, as requests get chained through these guys using the, the um, embedded network service mesh uh, APIs for um, getting services and um, uh, providing services, uh, providing getting network services themselves and providing network services, that's the key thing in the API. Uh, as those requests flow between these guys, uh, I'll show how they use Spiffy Inspire to sort of make sure they're secure. Um, it has a um, the, the reason, the big reason that we, oops, sorry about that. The big reason we were interested in this is because um, within NSM, if you're familiar with the project or if you want to go look at it, there's a, uh, they have a, what they call a floating interdomain use case. And the, the, the big thing about that use case is those, those API communications uh, most uh, cross multiple cluster boundaries. And they might, and potentially, as I said before, as you're talking about crossing multiple cluster boundaries, you potentially may have to cross into multiple security domains. So uh, it, uh, that's why I thought it was a great use case to display the Spiffy Inspire capabilities here uh, for this talk. <clears throat> so again, uh, if you don't know uh, NSM, try not to worry too much about um, what the individual modules do here. But the um, the idea here is you'll have a network service <coughs> endpoint. I haven't shown the workload or the ultimate client yet in this case. And it's going to do a network service request uh, to the network service manager. And uh, as since we, we ultimately need to um, um, have connection between these two NFEs that are on different clusters for this particular network service request, there's a whole chain of API requests of a simple API, but more than nonetheless, a chain of API requests that go around. And in, in um, <clears throat> the use case that I, I, I'll demo later, it involves three clusters, uh, sort of a, a client cluster and a server cluster, if you will, and then um, a control cluster. But the, the details are really matter. The idea is request, 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 request. Now all these need to be authenticated. We need to know who each of these uh, elements are, whether the element is who they expect it um, to be, and we want to uh, use encryption along the way. So how does NSM do this? So uh, here's kind of the architecture. Um, it, you'll see that there's nothing really outstanding or, or kind of um, really uh, novel about this architecture. I kind of showed it before, but if we superimpose uh, what I showed you just before, we have uh, Spire servers, uh, Spire agents, 
Um, we have some search generation. Um, in the case that I'm showing here, we're, we're going to show a common root. Uh, I kind of was expounding on how that's a little limiting, but nonetheless, that's uh, what the demo will currently do. Um, and then I try to show uh, my key over here tries to show um, some of the SVID propagation that happens and the MTLS exchanges that uh, come along the way. So uh, now I'm going to try to go into a little bit of a demo um, on this. Uh, unfortunately, I chose not to do this real time. So um, hopefully this all comes through in a recording. Um, uh, let me go back here and let me try to start the screen. Hopefully everybody's able to see this. But uh, this uh, initially shows the current topology that I have, uh, and then I'm going to start showing you uh, aspect of the topology. So first thing I'm going to do is show you uh, we have Spire server and agents deployed. And it's not going to be on three clusters. You'll see <clears throat> slightly different naming. Um, my cluster, this is all based on kind. So for those familiar with kind, you'll see my um, I'm using the kind API servers and using a context. <clears throat> so we need to bootstrap the server. Um, in this case, I do it with, uh, I create a secret. And you can see that, um, I named that secret for Spire. Now, um, because I said we're using a common root, I'm showing you here that all the secrets are the same. I just did a diff of getting the secret and the key parts of the secret are the same. And then um, via some of the uh, magic uh, within NSM and uh, Spire, we actually end up uh, <clears throat> getting a config map with a certificate that Spire uses. And uh, I also show here that that certificate ends up being the same in all the Spire uh, servers. So that, that was a little quick. Maybe I'll just go back for a second. Um, oops. So if we just hold it there, you'll see that uh, I'm getting uh, the config map from uh, two different clusters and showing that the, the key parts of that config map, the certificate itself is the same. I show um, the Spire server config. This is where uh, this is some of the config we put together to bootstrap it. Uh, you can see there's the, 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 the secret that I created telling it where the, um, the name of it. And uh, I created a trust domain here. Um, we're going to highlight all the aspects of it. And right now, I want to show you that we don't initially have the endpoint or um, neither the, the client endpoint nor uh, the NSEs registered. So if I, my, my, um, my actual name here, of my application is going to be hello. So I just grabbed in here and saw that uh, there's no hello registration in the certificate right now. So now I'm going to deploy uh, the NSEs. Now, uh, again, the, the key thing for those not familiar with network, uh, network service manager, the network service element is, is, a, is a pod, typically a pod. Uh, that provide some kind of network service um, or some kind of network function. Um, and then um, I actually have a hello world pod. In this case, uh, again, all the details are not that important. Um, since we're doing the floating interdomain, basically the details are, I end up interconnecting these NSEs so these guys can talk, but I'm not really gonna get too much into that detail in this talk. <clears throat> so we continue on a little bit. Let's get the NFD pods. Um, I actually have two uh, network service element pods running here. And what I want to show here is that we mount a socket in the NSE 
so that it can talk to the workload API of Spire. So this is one of the key things to make sure that Spire can attest that uh, this network service element is who they are, say they are. Now I just showed the hello pod. And as part of this in the background, I don't show the actual steps, but we've actually registered um, with uh, Spire that those workload service accounts may try to connect to them and should be provided a certificate. So here's, um, um, I show these two here, there's the NSE and the client itself. So now uh, once that was registered, then these guys can get an identity from the Spire agent on the given node. So we're gonna show a little bit of that here. Um, this is, um, let me just go back a little bit on a little quick. So what I am showing here is the Spire agent um, on, on a particular one of the clusters. Uh, oh, by the way, my clusters are single node clusters. So that's why I don't get into too much of the node um, attestation steps, but anyway, nonetheless. Um, and what we show here is that uh, the Spire agent did see a request um, from someone that has the hello client service account and it will go ahead and provide an SVID to it. And then we can look at the server and we can see from the server SVIDs that um, it's um, signed and rotating both because it took me a long time in between doing this and capturing it. So you can see some of the rotation that happened in, in between. So now uh, we're gonna move on here and I'm gonna try to show you um, it's a little difficult. Uh, uh, this part's a little tricky to show in a, well in a demo, but I'm going to attempt to do it anyway. Um, how each request in the chain is using MTLS. So um, I'm going to do that with some code snippets, Jagger tracing, and some logs. So the first uh, thing, um, let me just pause this, is that uh, this is from uh, Network Service Mesh itself. Uh, there's a trace point for Jaeger. Uh, since a lot of this code is done by libraries, uh, uh, all I want to really show is that we hit this trace point because you can see that immediately uh, we're going to go and get a TLS config um, for that um, uh, based on this uh, uh, GeoPC new server call. I think I'm going to have just enough time here. So let's look at some of the logs to try to see this. So if we uh, if we look at the um, uh, the hello world container log, this is uh, from from uh, the client or server side. If we jump down here, uh, we can see here uh, the two key lines I want to show you here is. Uh, right shortly after the this came up, because this is from the init container, it actually um, uh, got a, a certificate issued from uh, Spiffy, and it, then it created the connection. So these are like a bang bang. Uh, right after the initial the initialization happens, um, it starts trying to do a communication with the server, and it's uh, establishing its identity. And so um, I'm going to try to show um, that Jaeger is actually capturing some of this. So Jaeger um, NSM has some nice ability to install Jaeger. And it looks at some traces. Sorry about the six hour delay, but it takes a while to make sure everything's running properly and capture thing and go through work distractions in between. But you can see here, the key thing I was trying to point out before is um, the, that GET certificate trace point uh, was hit by this code. Oops. And with that, um, We've been able to, uh, oops, um, sorry, back to the 
slide decks. I'm pretty much done. Uh, the only thing I wanted to say is I got a lot of help from various people uh, to get this done. So I wanted to acknowledge them and uh, then that's it, um, except for questions. So Jerry, how do we want to do questions? Um, well, thank you, John, for a great uh, presentation. Um, I'll, I'll read off the questions to you one by one in the Q&A box. We have about five minutes left. So if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask, um, please uh, put them into the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can. We do have one here. Um, would similar authorization architecture work for Istio and Envoy-based service mesh implementation? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Istio uh, is one of the service meshes that um, actually allow authorization um, within um, as part. It has an, it has authorization capabilities um, within its API and within its um, um, control plane and how it pushes it down to Envoy. Envoy itself uh, definitely has a lot of capabilities um, in the authorization vein. So Envoy, no matter where it's used, um, has those capabilities. Um, but the service mesh that's controlling it, some do, some don't. Now, I, in, in the example I gave for authorization, I used an SMI uh, API uh, object. Uh, I'm pretty sure Istio doesn't support the SMI API objects themselves. They have their own API objects, but they, all, they do support uh, authorization capabilities um, um, similar to what I showed. Do we have any more questions at all? Okay, great. Um, I, just, I guess with that, thank, thank you all for attending. I um, hope you all enjoyed it and hope it all came out pretty good. It was hard for without feedback to see if uh, everybody was able to see everything that I hope they saw or hear me well enough, but I hope it worked out well for everybody. Uh, there's one more question here. There is a V-wire on one of the slides. Would it be possible for you to elaborate a bit more on that? Um, oh, okay. Um, not sure exactly. Oh, okay. On this slide. So, um, yeah, uh, that's not uh, germane to what I was trying to show here, uh, but I'll, uh, since I have a few minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. But um, network service mesh, uh, vWire is a key construct within network service mesh itself. So network service mesh, the, the, the main, if you're not familiar with it, that at a macro level, what you have is you have uh, network service elements that provide a network service. You have clients that I don't show on this page. Um, uh, show on the other thing that might request a network service mesh. And then um, the NSM uh, manager wants to connect um, those clients to the network service. Now, in this particular example, since I'm using uh, what's known as a, a floating interdomain uh, network service, the, the network service actually has to span across clusters. So essentially, um, a better way to show this, if I can by my arrows um, is, is um, uh, uh, maybe, maybe I'll stay with this one. So a better way to show this is that um, for this particular network service, I, I need a vWire from uh, the NSC uh, to the client, which I don't show, but, but assume it's there. Um, and then I'll need vWires from the forward or across the cluster boundaries. Uh, I'll need a uh, vWire from the forwarder to the NSEs, and then I'll need another vWire from this NSE to the, the server side. So essentially, uh, network service mesh is using what they, the construct called a vWire, uh, a virtual wire, is how it's actually uh, choosing to interconnect um, a client's request for a service with what that service entails. Uh, in this case, the service entails crossing cluster boundaries. Okay, well, that just about all the time we have for today. Um, I want to thank you again, John, for a wonderful presentation. And I would like to thank everybody for their questions and for participating in today's webinar. Um, that's about all the time that we have.
Um, as I said before, the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. Thank you again, everyone, for attending. Uh, everyone take care, stay safe, and we will see you at the next webinar. Okay, bye.